Formula E is an all-electric racing series backed by the FIA, which premiered with its first E-Prix in Beijing back in 2014. Now in Season 3, Formula E races have already taken place in five continents, with more unique and interesting cities being added to the schedule every season. Formula E was initially an idea of FIA President Jean Todds, and with his contact book in motorsport, media and business, was picked up by Spanish businessman Alejandro Agag, who turned Todd's vision into reality. The race of the future is about to begin. A race, entertainment, show that will have a positive effect in society. Agag and Formula E Holdings have a 25-year contract with the FIA, so we'll be seeing electric street racing on the streets of our cities for many years to come. Right now there are a total of 10 teams in Formula E, with each team having two drivers and each driver two cars. For anybody familiar with Formula 1, there are some very recognisable names in there. The legend that is Alain Prost heads up the championship winning Renault Edams team, whilst amongst the drivers names have included Bruno Senna, Nelson Piquet Jr, Lucas de Grassi, Jacques Villeneuve, Nick Heidfeld, Esteban Gutierrez and of course current Formula E champion, the Swiss driver Sebastian Buemi. Other teams involved in Formula E include some of the biggest car manufacturers around. Jaguar, Audi, DS and BMW are all involved. Mercedes have taken an option to be part of the 2018-2019 season, with all the potential of more names being added all of the time. He won in Hong Kong, he won in Marrakesh, and by winning in Argentina, he is the man to take a hat-trick of Formula E wins. Buemi is already dominating season three, but those challenging for the top position include Lucas de Grassi, Nico Prost, and even the rookie driver, Felix Rosenquist. Alongside the drivers, the series is not without glamour, with top Hollywood actor and environmental campaigner Leonardo DiCaprio chairing the Sustainability Committee, and Sir Richard Branson heading up the DS Virgin team. The most outstanding thing about Formula E cars is that they're fully electric. This means no fuel tank, no exhaust pipes and cars that sound like nothing else in motorsport. Most components on the cars are standardised across all teams, helping to ensure incredibly close racing. In Formula 1, a team's success or failure to master their aerodynamic package is one of the most important factors determining whether you have a quick car or a slow one. In Formula E, all of the cars are aerodynamically identical. The battery that powers the cars is also identical for all teams. Since Season 2, the teams have been able to develop their own motor, inverter and gearbox, a set of components often referred to as the powertrain, to get the most out of the fixed energy available from the battery. Eight out of the ten teams have chosen to do this, and it's really interesting to note that no two powertrain designs are currently the same. The fierce technological competition between the teams has resulted in efficiencies of over 90%, compared to just 25% for a conventional road car with a gasoline engine. The differences in design strategy are huge and fundamental. Over the past two seasons, we've seen teams use one motor, two motors, a single gear, two, three, four, or even five gears. So, how quick are the cars? An average Formula E car is able to accelerate from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in just three seconds, and to reach a maximum speed of around 225 kilometers an hour. In fact, the cars would run even faster than that, but the speed has been capped for safety reasons, as most of the races take place in city centers with some tight sections and very little runoff. For many, the beauty of Formula E is that the majority of the races take place on street circuits around the world. This can often mean tighter tracks, fiercer battles to overtake, and a passionate local crowd that are only metres away from the action. Unlike a purpose-built racing circuit, there are bumps in the road, manhole covers, white lines and cambers to think about. Just a few days before the race, these will have all been part of busy city centre road networks. Also, unlike a traditional racing circuit, there's very little runoff area in the middle of a city, meaning just one wrong move can very quickly end a driver's race. This makes a street circuit a very exciting setup for a fan. It also places Formula E right in the heart of some of the globe's most iconic cities, and for just a few days, the city streets are taken over by this spectacular event. Formula E is unusual in that practice, qualifying and the race itself all happen on the same day. Free practice one is a 45 minute session at the start of the day when the drivers really start to get to grips with the track. Although they may have practiced on the circuit for around 100 hours or so in their simulators, this is when they finally get to find out about the lumps, bumps and tight corners of the city street circuit. Expect twists, turns and smashing into the barriers as we see all the teething problems come to light in this first practice.
There's then one further practice session, free practice two, and it's the driver's last chance to really learn the track before going into qualifying and to gather as much data as they can for the team. Then, at midday, it's on to qualifying. The cars go out in four randomly selected groups of five cars each. Each group has six minutes on the track. So with an outlap and an inlap, this means that the drivers really only have one shot at nailing their qualifying time. One small mistake could wreck months of preparation, so the stakes are high. For qualifying, the cars are set to their maximum power of 200 kilowatts. This is the one chance for the driver to set their best lap time. The five drivers who set the best times in qualifying then move on to the Super Pole, an electric 15 minutes where the drivers go out one by one with the slowest of the five going first to set their fastest lap and try and win the Julius Baer pole position. This often leads to real tension between the two front runners, like Lucas de Grassi and Sebastian Buemi in London at the end of season two. Not only does this set the formation for the grid, but the pole sitter also gains an extra three vital championship points. Pole position, what a fantastic start to the season. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Then it's officially Park Firm A, where any work on the cars has to be approved and supervised by the scrutineers. They get charged up and then that's it. They've done all they can. Now there's just one thing for it, to race. After qualifying, the starting grid for the race is set. There's no formation lap, so the drivers hurtle down towards turn one on cold tyres and cold brakes, always a recipe for first corner action. There is no typical Formula E racetrack, as each street circuit is very different from the next, but the race is run for around 50 minutes and the track is normally around two and a half kilometres in length. The cars are set to a maximum power of 170 kilowatts in race mode, although there is an exception to this with fan boost. More on that later. During the race, the drivers have to swap to their second car. This normally happens around lap 13 to 17. Unlike other motorsports, teams are not allowed to change tyres unless they're punctured or damaged, and this applies even if it rains. Formula E uses Michelin all-weather tyres, so there's no need for intermediates or wets like in other series. As with any pit stop, drivers and their teams practice their car changeover, and there's strategic thinking about when to make this change too, as there's a limit to how much energy each car can carry. Drivers have to ration their energy and think about when it makes sense to save energy or when to push and go for more speed. Keep pushing, battery 55. The team is in constant radio communication with the driver and the car is sending essential data back to the team. Unlike other sports, in Formula E, fans can vote for their favourite drivers to win a fan boost. This is done via social media and runs in the week building up to an E-Pre and during the opening six minutes of the race. The three drivers who win the fan boost each receive an extra 100 kilojoules of energy to be used in a power window between 180 kilowatts and 200 kilowatts. This is often used to close the gaps, defend, or go for an essential overtake. And he's using it now. Here comes Lucas de Grassi. Break, balance, break, balance. Pushes the fan boost, and D'Ambrosio covers the inside line, and de Grassi still tries to look to the inside line. So close between them, de Grassi locks up, manages to get it stopped in time, and takes the lead of the Mexico E3. The winner of the race gets 25 points, with the top 10 positions also scoring. There's also an extra point for whoever sets the Visa fastest lap during the race, so there's something to aim for even if you're running below 10th. What we've often seen happen is a driver damaged their first car early on and limp back to the pits to get in their second car. Even though in this situation they simply don't have enough energy to get to the end of the race, there's still a championship point to play for by finding some clean air on the circuit and putting in a quick lap. Yeah, come in the garage, come in the garage, you stop in the pit lane, you stay in the car, we're gonna put full down force, we're gonna put full down force and see if we can go for a fastest lap. In fact, this is how Season 2's title was decided, following an opening lap crash between Buemi and Degrassi, who were level on points. Both guys limped back to the pits and the title decider became a hot lap shootout between the two for the Visa fastest lap. Great entertainment for us fans. Any top-level sport is underpinned by great strategists and Formula E presents its own unique strategic challenges. Of course, once the cars are built and the season kicks off, race strategy becomes crucial. While complex, Formula E strategy is best thought of in terms of getting the maximum motion from the minimum energy, doing the most with the least. Every driver has to stop at some point during the race to switch into a fully charged car. 
This presents opportunities to outwit your rivals. The most common strategy we see in Formula E is drivers doing everything they can to be able to go a lap longer than their rivals in their first cars by saving and regenerating as much energy as possible. Box this lap, box, box. You're tight on energy. If you can do this without losing too much time, that means in your second car you've got to do a lap less. And that means more power, more aggression, more overtaking, and ultimately, more points. Formula E was set up to help in the fight against climate change and to improve the quality of the air we all breathe. By being involved with Formula E, car manufacturers have a unique opportunity to really push electric car technology to its limits and to learn directly from these experiences. This can result in big moves forward for them in their development of their electric road cars. Already we've seen Formula E teams create stunning, exciting, super fast, fully electric vehicles, changing the whole face of the automotive industry. But Formula E's commitment to the environment isn't just limited to the cars. The whole Formula E event is powered by a largely renewable mix of energy sources. The gaming arena is sometimes powered by photovoltaic solar panels and spectators are encouraged to use public transport to and from the races, which is made a lot easier with city centre locations. Even the race calendar is structured to minimise air miles as much as possible. Alongside being a competitive, exciting race series, Formula E's main aim is to promote the use of electric vehicles, bringing forward the day when electric cars are the norm on our roads and leading the way towards a cleaner future. You can find out more by following Formula E and Julius Bear on social media.